So this morning we are going to start on a lecture series that will be focusing on the digestive system. We are going to cover a number of things. But uh, before I tell you what you're going to focus on, let me give you the anatomical division of the components of the digestive system. So we divide the components of the digestive system anatomically into two categories. We have what we call the hologeity, which is basically the path that is followed by food. So this hologeity is what you can sometimes call the gut or the alimentary canal. But then we also have what we call the extrinsic organs of the digestive system. The extrinsic organs of the digestive system refer to those organs which are not necessarily within the wall of the GIT, but provide their secretions into the lumen of the GIT. And so in particular, they refer to these glands which are outside the wall of the JT, like salivary glands, pancreas, liver, and gallbladder. Today we'll be focusing largely on the whole JT. The next week we'll focus on the extrinsic glands. <clears throat> but in terms of functions, we can state that the JT is responsible for delivering water and nutrients to the rest of the body. It is also having some endocrine functions. And when we talk of endocrine functions of the digestive system, we can cite examples like the pancreas produces hormones, but we are not limited to the pancreas only. The liver also produces some hormonal substances for, for sure. <clears throat> and uh, also the intestines have some cells which also produce hormones. We call them the gut hormones. And so don't limit yourself to the endocrine functions of the pancreas only. The liver has endocrine functions. The intestines have endocrine functions. The third role of the JT is that it is responsible for excretion of waste products. And this is primarily through the biliary system. Things like bilirubin are excreted through the bile. And lastly, we can talk of immune functions of the digestive system. This is in particular to refer to the fact that the acid within the stomach is able to kill germs that enter the body. So protecting against infections. But again, we are not limited to the acidity of the stomach. We also have several lymphoid aggregations within the wall of the JT. And those several lymphoid aggregations within the wall of the JT also participate in defense against infections. All right, so those are the functions. <clears throat> in physiology, you'll be told that there are four basic food processes. The first process is what you call the ingestion process, which is the uptake of food up to the stomach. And so ingestion will involve two key steps. The first step is mastication, which is chewing. That's a mechanical breakdown of food in the mouth. And then the second step of ingestion is swallowing or deglutition. And in physiology, you'll be told that deglutition has three phases, the oral phase of swallowing, the pharyngeal phase of swallowing, and the esophageal phase of swallowing. And out of those, the pharyngeal phase of swallowing is the most critical because the pharynx is a common pathway for both food and air. 
After ingestion, food become digested. Digestion is the enzymatic breakdown of food into absorbable units, which are usually smaller. The food substances that need to be digested are these big ones like carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. We do not necessarily digest vitamins. They are already in their absorbable units. The primary site for digestion of food is the duodenum and the jejunum. And that confirms why the duodenum actually is the one that also receives the pancreatic juice that help in the digestion. Stomach, however, is also another site of digestion, but not the primary site of digestion. Once food has been digested, then it is absorbed. Absorption of nutrients primarily take place in the ileum, Yet again, water and minerals are absorbed in the colon. After absorption, whatever remains is what we call stool. And then that will have to undergo the last process, which is defecation, which is basically the reflex elimination of waste. So these are the basic food processes. I've taken you through those steps because we are not going to discuss them in anatomy, but it's important that you know about them. So what's our learning agenda? The first thing we are going to do is to name the components of the hologeity from the proximal part to the distal part. At that point, we'll also name the various sphincters which are along the JT. Then we'll talk about the structure organization of the JT wall. How is the JT wall organized structure? When I use the term JT, I'm, I'm referring to gastrointestinal tract. We will then talk about the anatomy of the various components of the alimentary canal. <clears throat> and perhaps that's where we will stop. Then next week, we will talk about the anatomy of the exocrine glands of the digestive system. And we'll also talk about the splanchnic circulation and its role. So let's start with the first agenda, which is a component of the hologeity. So here we just want to follow food from your plate into the toilet. So food goes through you in that long journey. From your plate, food will go to the mouth. The oral cavity is the mouth. Then from the mouth, food does not go to the esophagus from the mouth. Food goes to the pharynx. Remember, pharynx is the throat which is a common passage for both food and air. From the pharynx, then food can now go to the esophagus, which is the food pipe. After esophagus, food goes to the stomach, <clears throat> which is the primary site of storage of food. From the stomach, food goes to the small intestine. But there are several segments, three segments, to be specific of the small intestine. And we'll be checking what's the trend, what's the order in which food will pass through the small intestine. From the small intestines, food goes to the large intestine. And again, we'll be seeing which part of the large intestine first, and then which part of the large intestine last. Basically, these are the components of the alimentary canal. <clears throat> Along the path of the food, there are some regions where we have sphincters along the wall of the JT. A sphincter could be a point of narrowing, but it's also a point where output is controlled from a proximal segment to the distal segment. <clears throat> 
the first sphincter that food meets from your oral cavity is the upper esophageal sphincter. The upper esophageal sphincter is located between the pharynx and the esophagus. This sphincter is formed by a muscle that we call cricopharyngeus muscle, from the word cricoid to pharynx, so cricopharyngeus muscle. That muscle is a tighter one, and uh, as a matter of fact, makes the upper esophageal sphincter the narrowest part of the alimentary canal. To the extent that if someone was to swallow a foreign body, and that foreign body manages to go through the upper esophageal sphincter, if it is not corrosive or dangerous, then you don't have to worry anything. Because if something can go through the upper esophageal sphincter, then it can go through any other part of the JT, including the ones you're thinking about because the upper esophageal sphincter is the narrowest part of the alimentary canal. That's important for you to remember, even from a clinical point of view, a number of times babies will be brought to you at casualty and you'll be told that this baby swallowed a coin. If you do a radiograph and you actually ascertain that the coin is beyond the upper esophageal sphincter, but it's within the JT. Just reassure them and tell them to go back home because that thing will pass one day through the anal sphincter finally. Well, as long as that thing that they've swallowed is not corrosive, like it's not a battery, you know, batteries will be, have some chemical corrosion within, as long as not something so sharp that is likely to tear the GIT as it's passing through, you really don't have to worry about. Then we have the lower esophageal sphincter. The lower esophageal sphincter is also known as the cardiac sphincter. This is the sphincter between the esophagus and the stomach. So this sphincter usually relaxes when you are swallowing to allow food to go into the stomach. And then it contracts to prevent uh, reflux of food from the stomach. There are cases where the sphincter refuses to relax when you are swallowing. You can imagine what will happen. Food will find it difficult to enter the stomach and so it accumulates in the stomach, in the esophagus quite a lot with the time. You'll be told what we call those diseases. Similarly, the sphincter may sometimes refuse to relax when it's supposed to relax. And that means it will be allowing substances to move from the stomach to the esophagus, <coughs> what we call gastroesophageal reflux disease. Not such a good thing to have because that's the one that will tend to give you those feelings of heartburn and the like. I'm not saying it's the only cause of heartburn. It's also the one that uh, is, will irritate the lower esophagus so much with the acidity of the stomach, it can lead even to stomach cancers later. Not stomach, but esophageal cancers. So that sphincter is important that it functions well. We have the pyloric sphincter. The pyloric sphincter controls output from the stomach to the duodenum. So basically it controls gastric output. A number of times you will find children whose pyloric sphincter are so tight. And that means that uh, food from the stomach cannot freely go to the small intestine. These children have a disease we call pyloric stenosis. We will be talking about it when you look at development and malformations of the GIT. There's a sphincter called the sphincter of OD. I've put it in a steric so that it can strike your attention. That's a unique one compared to the rest of the sphincters. 
What makes Sphinct of Odi unique is that it is not really part of the alimentary canal. It is not a sphincter that is controlling movement of food from proximal segment to another, no. It has sphincter that is controlling flow of bile from the biliary system into the GIT. But based on its position, it is also controlling the pancreatic secretions from the pancreas, pancreatic juice from the pancreas into the GIT. So it has sphincter located in the duodenum to basically control flow of bile as well as pancreatic juice from where they're coming from into the duodenum. Then we have the ileocecal valve. Ileocecal valve is a valve-like structure as the name suggests. And basically it prevents backflow into the small intestine from the cecum. Once uh, intestinal contents have moved from the small intestine to the large intestine, they shouldn't go back. And so this one prevents that reflux. Then we have the anal sphincter. The anal sphincter has two parts. We have the internal and the external anal sphincter. The internal anal sphincter is made up of smooth muscle. And so it is involuntary. You do not have conscious control over it. Unlike the external anal sphincter, that is made up of skeletal muscles. And so you do have voluntary control over it. You agree with me that you need both of them. For example, when you are asleep, you don't want to wake up and find that you soiled your bed. But again, when you are in class or you are in a matter too, or you are in church, you don't want people to be complaining, what is this smelling? Well, sometimes they do. But at least you agree with me that you have control over the anal sphincter. So even if you release the gas slowly, you usually release in such a way that you don't want people to hear, especially if you're in a public place, because you are consciously controlling your anal sphincter. So the external sphincter is consciously controlled. The internal sphincter is involuntary. They both control output from the rectum. So that is the path followed by JT, sorry, followed by food from the oral cavity all the way to the anal canal. Let's now talk about the structural organization of the JT wall before we talk about the anatomy of each of those segments of the holo JT. So histologically, the gut wall has four layers. The innermost layer is called the mucosa, followed by a layer that we are calling the submucosa. The third layer is the muscular layer, also known as muscularis propria. And the fourth layer is the adventitia, also known as serosa. And I'll be telling you when we call it adventitia and when we call it serosa. Let's start with the mucosal layer. <clears throat> so the mucosal layer is the innermost layer of the GIT wall. This mucosal layer is basically made up of lining epithelium. So there's an epithelium that lines the inner side of the JT, that's what I mean. The type of the epithelium will vary depending on the region of the JT. Those regions of the JT that experience a lot of friction, like oral cavity, esophagus, will be and 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 the anal canal will be having stratified squamous epithelium 
And then the rest of the JT, which don't experience a lot of friction, will have simple columnar epithelium. So simple column epithelium extends from the stomach all the way to the rectum. That is simple column. But the parts that experience a lot of friction, oral cavity, esophagus, <clears throat> and the enocanal, I forgot to mention also the pharynx, those ones have stratified squamous epithelium. Deep to the epithelial lining is a connective tissue zone commonly known as the lamina propria. Usually it may be a loose connective tissue region, but importantly, the lamina propria contain extensions of the epithelial lining which form glands the lamina propria contain glands of the mucosa. We call them mucosal glands. <clears throat> and basically all parts of the JT may be having the mucosal glands. There are glands in the mucosa of every part of the JT. However, the glands in the mucosa of the stomach have the majority and we call them gastric glands so much so that sometimes that's the only thing you see in the mucosa. So the ones of the stomach are called gastric glands. The ones of the intestines, whether small or large, are known as the crypts of Libacon. You can call them the intestinal glands, but we commonly call them the crypts of Libacon. So basically remember that the lamina propria is a loose connective tissue that contain mucosal glands. All parts of the JT will have mucosal glands, but the proportion vary depending on the part of the JT we have. Important also to mention, not particularly written in this slide, is that the lamina propria also contain several lymphoid aggregations and the degree or the number of lymphoid aggregations also vary depending on the part of the JT we're looking at. Most of the lymphoid aggregations are in the ileum as well as the appendix. That's where most of the lymphoid aggregations are found. But any part of the JT mucosa can have lymphoid aggregation. Beyond the mucosa, we talk of the submucosal layer. The submucosal layer is a zone of dense, irregular connective tissue. This dense, irregular connective tissue layer contain a number of nerve plexuses within it. The nerve plexus, which is found within the submucosa of the JT, is simply known as the submucosal nerve plexus or the Meissner's plexus. So this submucosal nerve plexus, also known as the Meissner's plexus of nerves, are part of the enteric nervous system and they primarily control the secretions of the JT. Important to note, however, is that the submucosal layer may also have some glands. And there are only two regions of the JT that have submucosal glands. These are the esophagus and the duodenum. The glands, the submucosal glands of the duodenum are in particular called the Brunner's glands. I'll be showing you those glands shortly. So remember, the submucosal layer is a dense irregular connective tissue zone which has nerves. However, there are some parts of the two segments of the JT where the submucosa contain glands, the esophagus and the duodenum. The third layer of the JT wall is a muscular layer. You can call it muscularis propria. The muscularis propria <clears throat> 
contain smooth muscle. Usually these smooth muscles are in two orientations. The inner ones run in a circular manner. So we call the inner circular layer and the outer ones run in a longitudinal manner. And so we call it the outer longitudinal layer. Between those two zones of muscles, we have a nerve plexus. The nerve plexus that is existent between these two muscles or within this layer is known as the myenteric plexus of nerves or we call it the Auerbach plexus of nerves. This is also part of the enteric nervous system. But in particular, the nerve plexus within this zone control peristalsis. Remember peristalsis are just contractions of the JT wall. So I've mentioned to you that the muscular layer of the JT consists of inner circular and outer longitudinal layers. That is true. And that these are layers of smooth muscle, that is true. There are however, exceptions to that rule. So that statement is only true for some parts of the JT. There are a few exceptions and I want to take you through those exceptions. I would start with the pharynx. I'll state two exceptions in the pharynx. The first exception is that for pharynx, the muscles of the pharynx are not smooth muscle. Instead, they are skeletal muscles. However, there are type of skeletal muscles that you do not have control over them. You now, know that we have what we call involuntary skeletal muscles. From our histology lectures, when you're in first year, we mentioned that generally skeletal muscles are voluntary and smooth muscles are involuntary. Yet today you are learning that there's a category of skeletal muscles which are involuntary, in particular, the skeletal muscles in the pharynx. <clears throat> So that is one exception that the muscles of the pharynx are skeletal instead of smooth muscle. The other exception to talk about in the pharynx is that the orientation of the muscles of these skeletal muscles is different. Instead of having the inner circular and outer longitudinal layer, we have the opposite. The pharynx has inner longitudinal layers or rather inner longitudinal layer and outer circular layer. I do not know whether you remember the names of those muscles of the pharynx in your head and neck series, but the longitudinal muscles of the pharynx which are inside are the ones we called those days, the palatopharyngeus, salpingopharyngeus, and stylopharyngeus muscle. There are those three muscles. They are vertical muscles of the pharynx, so they're longitudinal, and they're on the inner side. Then the circular layer of muscles, the pharynx also consists of three mus muscles. We call them those days the constrictor muscles of the pharynx. So we talk of superior pharyngeal constrictor, the middle pharyngeal constrictor, and the inferior pharyngeal constrictor. In particular, the inferior pharyngeal constrictor has two parts. There's a part of it that come from thyroid cartilage. So we call it thyropharyngeus. And there's a part of it that comes from the cricoid cartilage. And so we call it cricopharyngeus. That latter one, cricopharyngeus, is the one I told you forms the upper esophageal sphincter. Right, remember I'm giving you exceptions <clears throat> to the rule that the muscular layer is made up of 
inner circular, outer longitudinal layer of smooth muscles. So I've given you an exception in the pharynx and I've noted two things. They are skeletal muscles and the orientations are different. The other exception to this rule is in the stomach. So in the stomach, we do not have two layers of muscles, but we have three layers of muscles. The additional layer is running obliquely and it's the innermost. For that reason, when you are naming the muscle layers of the stomach, we don't talk of inner circular and outer longitudinal. Yes, the longitudinal one is still out, but the circular one is not the inner one, it's in the middle. So we talk of inner oblique, middle circular, and outer longitudinal layer of muscles. That is with regard to stomach. And lastly, the other exception is in the colon. For the colon, yes, there are smooth muscles and yes, we have two layers, inner, circular and outer longitudinal. But the outer longitudinal layer of muscles of the pharynx exist in bands. And those bands are called tinea coli. So they exist in bands. They don't cover the whole wall. They just exist in three bands, which you call tinea coli. And I'll be showing you tinea coli shortly as well. So that's the organization of the muscular layer. Then finally, we have the outermost layer of the JT, which we call the adventitial layer or serosal layer. It's just a thin layer of connective tissue. In terms of terminology, if this thin layer of connective tissue is lined by peritoneum, which means it is within the abdomen <clears throat> and the membrane peritoneum is covering it, then we term, the term we give to it is serosa. If it is lacking the peritoneal membrane over it, then we call it adventitia. Nothing much about this outer layer. That is the structural organization of the JT wall. Now let's talk about the anatomy of the different parts of the whole JT. And as I told you, that's where we will end at object number three. Well, it's still a long objective. Let's start with the oral cavity. So the oral cavity is what you call the mouth. Usually the mouth has two compartments. There's this compartment, which you call the vestibule of the mouth. And this is the vestibule of the mouth. The region between the teeth and the cheeks or the lips. That's what you call the vestibule of the mouth. Into this vestibule, that's where the parotid duct opens. Usually the parotid duct opens in the vestibule of the mouth opposite the second maxillary molar tooth. So somewhere there. Then we have the oral cavity proper. The oral cavity proper is this region enclosed by the teeth. It is within the oral cavity proper that we have the tongue. The roof of the mouth is called the palate. There are two parts of the palate. The anterior part of the palate has bone, so we call the hard palate, as you remember from head and neck anatomy. And the posterior part of the palate is called soft palate because it lacks bone. Posteriorly, the oral cavity is continuous with the pharynx. So this region here is the boundary between the oral cavity and the pharynx. This boundary between the oral cavity and the pharynx is known as the oropharyngeal isthmus. Oropharyngeal isthmus. <clears throat> 
from the oral cavity food goes to the pharynx and uh, i've already told you or rather we had already learned some time back that the pharynx extends from the base of the skull to the upper part of the esophagus and that's a common passage for both food and air we have three parts of the pharynx the oropharynx the nasopharynx and the laryngopharynx so we name part of the pharynx based on which anatomical space is anterior to that segment of the pharynx that's why we have a nasopharynx we have an oropharynx and we have a laryngopharynx i don't want to talk much about the pharynx because these are parts we've done in our previous sessions so that does not mean that I can't ask you about them. It just means that I don't want to repeat myself so much. There are parts you already know. So if you've forgotten something about the pharynx, revisit, because I can still ask about the pharynx part of the JT. Then food goes to the esophagus. So the esophagus connects the pharynx to the stomach. There's a part of the esophagus which is in the neck, we call it cervical esophagus. There's a part that is in the thorax, we call it thoracic esophagus. And there's a small segment of the esophagus which is in the abdomen. And so we call it abdominal esophagus. The abdominal segment is the shortest part. We already told you that uh, there are two sphincters that govern the esophagus, the upper esophageal sphincter and the lower esophageal sphincter, which is also called the cardiac sphincter. Histologically, this is how the esophagus would look like. So this is the lumen of the esophagus. Usually the esophagus has longitudinal folds, which cut in cross-section will appear like this. So this would be the epithelial lining of the esophagus, which is stratified squamous, non keratinous epithelium. And uh, this is the region of the lamina propria. Then deep to that, this is the submucosal layer. And you can see submucosal layer contain glands. Esophagus and duodenum are the only parts of the JT that contain submucosal glands. Beyond the submucosa, we have the muscular layer. So this is the inner circular layer of muscles. And this is the outer longitudinal layer of muscles. <clears throat> Esophagus being largely not within the abdomen will not have a serosa. So it has a, an adventitia, which is a thin connective tissue layer. We hardly see it as you can visualize from that area. I forgot to tell you that the esophagus muscular layer also is unique and perhaps need to mention. Yes, I told you that the pharynx has skeletal muscles, but the rest of the JT have smooth muscle, that's true. Esophagus has a mixture. The upper part of the esophagus are skeletal muscles, but there are also those skeletal muscles that you do not have control over that involuntary. The lower third of the esophagus contains smooth muscles. The middle third of the esophagus is a mixture of skeletal and smooth muscles. But the orientation is standard, <clears throat> inner circular and outer longitudinal layer. So this image shows you the epithelial lining of the esophagus what is notable is that it is stratified squamous non keratinous epithelium. All right, this other one is showing us the muscular layer of the esophagus, inner circular outer layer of muscles. So that's how the esophagus would look like histologically. It is important that we understand the blood supply to the esophagus because of the various pathologies that we sometimes see related to the esophagus. <clears throat> 
So I'll tell you the arterial blood supply to the esophagus and the venous drain to the esophagus, and we'll talk about its clinical importance. Having mentioned that the esophagus has cervical segment, thoracic segment, and abdominal segment, the blood supply to the esophagus is also segmental. So the vessels which go to the esophagus are basically called esophageal arteries. But those esophageal arteries will come from different parts. There are multiple esophageal branches of big arteries which go to the esophagus. So the cervical esophagus receive esophageal branches of the inferior thyroid artery, which means that the inferior thyroid artery, the artery that goes to the thyroid gland, gives esophageal branches which go to the esophagus. So you can just say that the cervical esophagus is supplied by esophageal branches of inferior thyroid artery. The thoracic segment of the esophagus is supplied by esophageal branches of the bronchial artery. Sijawai. Okay, that was a break. So basically, the thoracic segment of the esophagus, this one, receives esophageal branches of the bronchial arteries. These are the arteries that supply the lungs, but they also give branches to the esophagus. And then we also have esophageal branches of the aorta. <clears throat> Those also supply the esophagus, the thoracic segment of the esophagus. So for the thoracic segment, I've given you two vessels which supply. Then the abdominal esophagus receives esophageal branches of the left gastric artery. In particular, I want you to remember that the lower esophagus, abdominal esophagus receives esophageal branches of the left gastric artery because that's where our clinical implication come from. <clears throat> from venous drainage then, the cervical esophagus drained to the inferior thyroid veins, just like the artery came from inferior thyroid artery. The thoracic esophagus drains to the azygous venous system. And then, the abdominal esophagus drains to the left gastric vein, which will take blood to the portal vein, which goes to the liver. So the point is this. <clears throat> At the lower esophagus, blood has two options of reaching the heart. From the lower esophagus, blood can join the azygous venous system and then go to the superior vena cava to go to the right atrium. But again, from the lower esophagus, blood can go to the left gastric vein, to the portal vein, to the liver, then to the inferior vena cava to the heart. So take note that blood from the lower esophagus has two options of reaching the heart. It can go via the liver or not via the liver. Regions where blood has those two options are known as regions of portocaval anastomosis. We can use the term portocaval anastomosis or we can use the term portosystemic anastomosis. Those are sites of portosystemic anastomosis. We will revisit this story of portosystemic anastomosis next week, and we'll see the clinical implications of that. Beyond the esophagus, we have the stomach. So the stomach is located within the epigastrium. <clears throat> 
as well as the left hypochondrium. You remember from last week, we indicated that the fundus of the stomach is in the left hypochondrium, but the body and the pylorus are in the epigastrium. As I indicated earlier, the muscular layer of the esophagus are three instead of two, remember that. In terms of parts, this is the fundus of the stomach. This is the cardia of the stomach. This is the body of the stomach. This is the pyloric region. The pyloric region of the stomach is divided into two. We have the pyloric antrum, this part, and the pyloric canal, that part. There are two curvatures of the stomach that are worth mentioning. The lesser curvature, which is up and to the right, and the greater curvature, which is down and to the left. In terms of blood supply to the stomach, the stomach receives blood supply from branches of the celiac artery. So there are those arteries which supply the lesser curvature of the stomach, and there are those arteries that supply the greater curvature of the stomach. This would be better learned practically when you come. So when you come for practicals, we will look at this and we'll see which artery supply which part of the stomach. Also, at that time, we will be revisiting how the different regions of the stomach are drained by lymph nodes. We may not see the lymph nodes in the lab, but after you learn the blood supply, it will be easier for us to understand the lymphatic drainage of the stomach because it has implications on how cancer of the stomach spread to different parts of the body. Histologically, the, in the wall of the stomach, as I mentioned to you, contains several glands. We call them gastric glands. This is how gastric glands would look like. There are several glands within the mucosa. Let's talk about those glands at a greater detail. Before we talk about the glands, the inner lining of the stomach is highly folded. Then the folds of this inner lining of the stomach is called the rugae. So these are because of folds of the stomach, we call them rugae. There are several glands on the surface of the mucosa of the stomach. These glands usually produce the gastric juice. There are several cell types of these glands. These are the glands. There are several cell types of these glands that produce the gastric juice. That, those gastric juice will be released through these holes, which we call the gastric pits. So we will mention the cell types of the gastric mucosa, and we'll state the substance that they secrete. We have the mucus cells, largely found near the neck. So sometimes we call them the mucus neck cells. These ones produce mucus. The purpose of the mucus is to lubricate the inner lining of the stomach to prevent against the corrosive effects of the acid. Then we have the chief cells of the stomach. The chief cells of the stomach also called the auxentic cells of the stomach. Sorry, not called the auxentic cells. I'll tell you the ones which are called auxentic cells. So the chief cells of the stomach, also called the principal cells of the stomach, produce pepsinogen. The pepsinogen is a proenzyme. So usually pepsinogen is converted to pepsin. Pepsin is the active enzyme that digests proteins. Then you have the parato cells. Now these are the ones we call the auxentic cells. The parato cells produce three substances. We have the hydrochloric acid. You can just call it gastric acid. Gastric acid 
is the one that kill germs. That's one of its role, to kill germs. So that's an immune function of the stomach. But the acid is also the one that converts pepsinogen to pepsin. So we need it for conversion of pepsinogen to pepsin. It forms a good environment for the action of some enzymes like pepsin itself, uh, salivary amylase, and salivary lipase enzymes. We have intrinsic factor also produced by the parietal cells of the stomach. The intrinsic factor is a substance that binds to vitamin B12, hence promoting its absorption in the ileum. So this does not mean that the stomach is a site of absorption of vitamin B12, that's not true. The, the stomach just produces the intrinsic factor. Then this intrinsic factor, okay, let me control that mic. All right, so then the intrinsic factor is the one that binds vitamin B12, then promoting its absorption. Remember vitamin B12 is what we call cyanocobalamin. We have another one which we call gastroferrin. Similar to what intrinsic factor is doing, gastroferrin does that to iron. So it binds iron, hence promoting the absorption of iron. That's why if a patient has an issue with parietal cells, <clears throat> then they may have issues with vitamin B12 as well as issues with iron. We have the enterochromaffin-like cells. Uh, I want you to add a hyphen here, then put the word like, enterochromaffin-like cells. Enterochromaffin-like cells are the ones that secrete histamine. Histamine, basically, we know that usually it's for inflammation. But in the stomach, it's not for inflammation. I know you do pharmacology and so you heard of histamine receptors. There are two types of histamine receptors. We have H1 receptors and H2 receptors. They are all stimulated by histamine. Stimulation of H1 receptors is the one that usually promote inflammation. And that's why when, when you're being given antihistamines, you're just being given the anti-H1 receptors to inhibit inflammation. But stimulation of H2 receptors don't necessarily promote inflammation. Stimulation of H2 receptors promote gastric acid secretion. And these are the type of receptors which are found within the, G the stomach, the H2 histamine receptors. So therefore the histamine in the stomach is not for inflammation, but for promoting gastric acid secretion. And so when you're managing patient with, let's say ulcerations, al peptic ulcer disease, we can still give them drugs which inhibit histamine, <clears throat> but they won't be drugs that target H1 receptors like piriton and the like. There'll be drugs which target H2 receptors of histamine. I don't know whether you know those drugs yet, but fine, let's leave it there. There's another category of cells in the gastric mucosa, which are not necessarily part of gastric glands because gastric gland is an exocrine gland producing secretions into a ductal system. But there are some cells which are in the gastric mucosa, but not part of the gland. 
these cells which are in the gastric mucosa produce hormonal substances. We generally call them the enteroendocrine cells. There are different types of enteroendocrine cells. We give them names according to the kind of secretions that they give. For example, we have the G cells of the stomach, which produce gastrin hormone. Gastrin usually promote gastric acid secretion as well. We have the D cells of the stomach. The D cells of the stomach secrete somatostatin. Somatostatin inhibits pancreatic secretions. So these cells are within the gastric mucosa, yes, but they are not part of the gastric gland because the gastric glands are exocrine glands. Right, so I think we've answered that. And so <clears throat> I think this table is a repetition of that in a different way. So we can just go through it quickly. That when we look at components of the gastric juice, the secretions which has come from the stomach, it will contain pepsin or pepsinogen, and the role is to digest protein. It will also contain acid, and that acid, its role is to activate pepsinogen to pepsin and also to have the immune functions. Also, gastric juice contain intensive factor, which promote vitamin B12 absorption. We mentioned that also contain gastroferrin from the same types of cells which promote absorption of iron. It may contain histamine, which has come from enterochromaffin like cells. And this one promote gastric acid secretion. <clears throat> and lastly, it contain mucus, which come from the mucus cells, which lubricate. So you notice that I've not added here the hormones because the hormones are not part of the juice. Right. I think we can stop there. Um, okay, let's talk about function in the stomach, then we stop there. So the key function of the stomach is for storage of food, usually for about two to three hours or three to four hours, depending on the size. It's also for mixing food some food substances are digested within the stomach, like uh, pepsin digest <clears throat> proteins, uh, salivary amylase digest uh, carbohydrates, starch specifically, salivary amylase is what we call tyrolin. Salivary lipase, also known as lingual lipase, uh, digest lipids in the stomach. There's some food substances, including alcohol, that can also be absorbed by the stomach. Uh, we have overemphasized on the immune function of the stomach by alluding to the fact that we have acid there. We've also emphasized on the fact that uh, we have intrinsic factor which promote absorption of vitamin B12. So I think we've done one hour. We will stop there. So you'll remind me to pick from there next time, where we'll talk about the small intestines, we'll talk about the large intestines, and we'll talk about the extrinsic organs of the digestive system. Right, so I'll invite you now for questions, if you do have. 